And uh, I definitely have a confession to make since we have a, a atmosphere of transparency here. Um, and that confession is I have modified my behavior to obtain belonging. And uh, do kids need to, are you ready to go? Okay, sweet. Sorry. You are, yeah. It's whatever. They can stay. I don't care. Has anyone ever modified their behavior to obtain belonging? Never. Um, I think it's so beautiful, even what just happened with Isaac and the kids, because Holy Spirit's really speaking belonging. And today, um, the the thing that I titled this message was called Lostness is Belonging. And if I think back on my church upbringing, you know, it's all about reaching the lost, right? And the lost is someone that is disconnected from God. And then when you, you know, re- repent as we defined it, which was, you know, come up to the altar and and grovel and ask for forgiveness and things like that. Um, and then you recited the sinner's prayer. Well, now you belong, but before you, you were lost. And so Holy Spirit's been speaking to me about uh, how lostness is actually evidence of original belonging. Because for something to be lost, it had to first belong. And um, when we modify our behavior, you can put that first one up, CJ. Um, but you got to click the background first. Guys, here's the deal. I'm not that great at delegating. I'm learning. <laughs> uh, Grace Culture has been a journey. We were a church plant. I was the only employee, so I learned how to do all this technical stuff, and in the process, failed at training other people. <laughs> so I am in this season of learning to delegate uh, better, and uh, so please forgive me. So Jesus is not fragile. Amen? Amen. So when we modify our behavior to obtain a sense of belonging, we actually imprison ourselves in our uniqueness. We are then trapped in an environment where we may be surrounded by people, but there's no connection or authenticity. This becomes exhausting, doesn't it? If we can shift from this mentality where we need to modify our behavior or lay our uniqueness down on the altar of acceptance, which honestly, religion is one of the biggest things that train us to do this, to forsake our uniqueness and then fit inside the box, which is is really not the Father's heart. Institutions do that, but the Father doesn't do that. He wants us to blossom and be us and be free. If we can shift from trying to obtain belonging to living from belonging, then you begin to actually like life in your own skin. If you know I already belong just for being me, and I was actually made well, and that I don't have to to change or conform to be accepted or to have belonging or to have community, you begin to actually get secure and confident in your own skin. And then you can enter situations or people groups and just be you. And if people take a little while to understand how awesome you are, it doesn't hurt you that bad because you know you already belong. And then eventually people start to get the memo that you're freaking awesome. And then they want to be around you because you are authentically you. And it's not a lie and it's not exhausting. And then these people begin to gravitate towards you and be magnetized towards you because you are authentic. And then you learn things like this person that you thought was authentic was actually pretending as well. When we're trying to obtain belonging through modifying behavior, we assume everybody else is free and we're the one that's bound, right? Everybody else that's already in the group, they're not modifying their behavior like I am because they're cool just as they are, but I'm not cool as I am. I'm I'm not that great, so I need to modify. But actually, they're probably or maybe pretending as well. And actually in that environment, someone who is authentically themselves needs to come in to shift the place. And that can be you. 
And I really think the first step in practically doing that is realizing you've always belonged with God. Because it all starts from our dynamic with our origin, who is the Father. We all come from Him. We come from the Father's heart. Before everybody told you you weren't wanted or that you were a nuisance or a mistake, the Father declared, I want you. You come from me. You have original belonging, not original lostness. And the lostness we experience is in our minds, not in, actual, in actuality and not in the Father's mind. Religion has been one of, if not the world's leading causes of feeling shame or inadequacy for who you are. Has anyone ever felt like you needed to apologize for who you are in church? I mean, we probably all have. Maybe you haven't. Praise God, that's awesome. And these, the people that led those institutions probably didn't set out to make people feel like that. But maybe they lacked a revelation of original belonging. And they were modifying behavior to obtain acceptance from God. So then they create a culture which comes out of their own mindset. Which is, I don't have belonging, I need to obtain it. So now the culture begins to be like that. Is this, uh, is this making sense to anybody? So how much healthier would we become as the family of God if we all began to understand that even when we feel lost, it means we belong? And we're going to look at some scripture for this stuff. We don't need an institution. Oh, I wanted to read a couple. Of, yeah, let me read that. Acts chapter 17, verse 22 through 31. Remember, we're talking about lostness is belonging. So Paul here, speaking of the context, is talking to pagans. You know, people that were not Christ followers. They had not said a sitter's prayer. Um, they were Stoics and philosophers. And in verse 22, he says, um, And they gave him audience unto this word, and then lifted up their voices and said, Wait, I'm in Acts chapter 22. I need to be in Acts 17, 22. Okay. It says, uh, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. So he's saying, he's trying to meet them in the middle and say, you guys are actually already worshiping the, the one true God, if you would, because they were pagan, they believed in many gods, because they had this altar to this unknown God. So, which I think is kind of humorous, because they had all of their deities, and they're like, well, what if there's one we, we forgot, or we missed? We want to make sure we're worshiping him, too. <laughs> so, we have the altar to the unknown God. God that made the world, okay, so whom you therefore ignorantly worship, him I declare unto you. God that made... I just th I love how Paul connects with his audience first. He's he's got to, you have to open someone's heart to even hear you if especially if you're about to minister Christian stuff to them. We have to really walk in wisdom. God that made the world and all things therein. Are you in the world? Are you part of all things there in the world? That means God made you. You came from him. He fashioned you. Seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, who dwells not in temples made with hands. God's not confined in the box. He's not only at grace culture. He's in you, and he walks around when you walk around. You're the temple of God. Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he gives to all life and breath and all things. So no matter who we're talking to, if, they're a, if they say they're a Christian or not, they have breath because they came from God. Because he gave us humanity breath. He gave us the breath of life. You don't inhale the breath of life after you recite a sinner's prayer. You already have the breath of life. And any lostness a person feels is evidence of their belonging. Because for something to become lost, it had to first already belong. This is, I believe, the beauty of our message. We're not declaring a message of rejection followed by hoops to jump through ending in belonging. 
It's a message of original belonging that then they wake up to and then they step into begin to walk it out in their practical life. Holy cow, I'm walking with Jesus just for being me. He gave me breath. He's not mad at me. He's not disappointed in me. He's been misrepresented to me, possibly by church people. That happens. People are imperfect. You could get hurt here too. Okay, this is not a perfect place. People get unintentionally hurt all the time. Um, so that they should seek and hath made of one blood. Can we say one blood? One blood. All nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord if haply they might feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us. So often we have a message of you are far from God. Here are the hoops to jump through to then draw near to him. Not true. Not true. For in him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, we are also his offspring, or in the Greek, genos. We are the genos of God, the offspring of God. For as much then as we are the genos, or the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device, and the times of this ignorance God winked at, I'm thankful God winks at my ignorance and now commands all men everywhere to repent. There's the R word. But it just means to change your mind. Think of the context. He's saying every person is near to God. That every person has breath because God gave it to him. And then he says, repent. In other words, shift your mind, change your mind from thinking he's far from you. And shift your mind to realizing in him we already live and move and have our being. We're inside of Christ right now. We belonged originally. Because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man who he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men. Okay, so God... This is in Acts. God in, now, it's past tense. God has judged the world, not in sin, but in righteousness, and has given assurance, not to some men, to all men. What an amazing thing we get to do is to relay this message to people that they can be assured that God is not far from them, that they haven't done too much, that they haven't missed it too much or lost his favor, that they have original belonging. We don't need an institution to find true belonging and unconditional acceptance, to find an environment where we can truly take off all the masks and show ourselves we need a family. This is why for the next few weeks, I'm not live streaming because I think there's some people in here that have stuff they, that's in them that's beautiful and that they want to come out and potentially haven't been releasing it because they're like, I don't want to be on live stream. <laughs> so it's filming, but we can edit stuff out or stop filming and then we'll post it later. But we're not live streaming for at least the next few weeks. Because I really sense there's so much treasure inside all of you, um, and it wants to come out. So this is a safe atmosphere of family and transparency where you can be you, you can release whatever you have to release. This is what God has provided. We seek the lost because lostness is proof of belonging. I hope you all are catching that concept. And if we could turn to Luke chapter 15, which all you Bible people knew I was about to turn, turn to. You don't have to nod your head, but I know you're in here. And I know your name. And I'm about to name sin. No, I'm just kidding. Some of you. And then the preacher begins to list all of his secret stuff. And say it's you. So, 
If you're still in this place where you find yourself modifying your behavior to belong, that's okay. You can be transparent about it. But I want today to be the day that you stop. I think we can even do this in parenting. We can modify behavior to be accepted by our kids. Or we can create an environment that's legalistic for our kids where they begin to be modify their behavior to be accepted by us. And it's a sobering thing to realize. I would think that all of us would agree we don't want to create that environment. And I am not perfect. I've flipped out on my kids. I've had moments of weakness. Can we say transparent atmosphere? Like, just give yourself a break. One of the most comforting things that I've heard said is from a friend of mine named Mark Derniak. He's up in Pennsylvania, and he said he's got three grown children, so he's got some credibility. He's like 55, three grown kids. They're doing well, whatever that means, uh, which I think that can be a big load of garbage. <laughs> oh, my kids are doing great. <laughs> I mean, all these expectations we have, let's just drop them. Let them fall. These timelines we put on kids, and then we say, oh, your kid's like two months behind. Reject all that. You don't have to be a slave to that, even though that's how people talk now. Is everybody okay? Um, and you yourself are not behind on any timeline. You'll just stay in discouragement if that's how you believe. So you can just reject it. So I forgot what I was saying. What was I talking about? Mark said... Your children will remember the spirit in which you parented them. So you have, yes, you have moments of weakness. Yes, you have moments where you step out of the love of God and you scream at them and you lose your patience. But they'll remember the spirit in which you parented, which is a spirit of love. So be comforted by that. Take, any, take a big breath. Move on. Don't beat yourself up too much. So what if you could kick that bag of heaviness that is your believing you need to modify your behavior to obtain belonging all the way up to the sun and burn it up? I'm just going to do this. And I'm going to picture it going up into the sun and then I'm kicking it. It's getting burned up. I'm no longer going to live enslaved by this belief that I'm not enough that my uniqueness is not cool, I need to conform, and that I need to modify my behavior to be accepted. If you can receive that you belong with the Father and always have, you actually already have belonging, you don't have to obtain it. If you can receive that, you'll get secure and you'll just be you and people will be drawn to the you of you. The you of you is not ugly. It's beautiful. Amber says a lot that the kingdom of God is about unified diversity. For that to happen, where it actually is unified diversity, where we love each other in the midst of differences, different personalities, different giftings, different politics, different all this stuff, it actually needs to be a family revelation. Because as long as it's religious institutions who, who gather based on how they believe, we won't get to unified diversity. We'll have this building over here where everybody's exactly alike, and this building over here where everybody's exactly alike, and this building over here where everybody's exactly alike, and we're actually divided. And if you look at the original word for Pharisee, it literally means separatist. So for us to step out of being separatist, we actually need to realize we're all one family. We just read it in Acts 17 that God made all men of one blood, and he has given assurance to all men that he's judged the world in righteousness. Thank you, Lord. That's good news. It's a much more beautiful and, I dare say the word, poetic message that we carry um, than I ever imagined. It's really, really beautiful. So if you read in Luke 15, verse 3, it says, And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, notice there's a hundred. At this point in the story, in other words, the one that's about to go astray already belonged. We always say even that song, we go after the one. Yes, but what we're doing is we're reminding them that they belong. We're not telling them you're lost. Do this to become belonging or accepted. 
we're saying, hey, you remember? You have a family. You have a father that loves you, that you originate from. You belong. He made you unique. You don't have to conform. You weren't made to be in a box. You were made to fly and be free. You know, fewer people reject that message than handing them a track that says Romans 23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And it stops. They never put verse 24, which says, And all have been justified freely by his grace. And if you study that out in the original... All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The word sin means miss the mark. And the word glory is doxa. It means the good opinion of God. For all have missed the mark of the good opinion of God. What man, man, man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner, one person missing the mark that repents, a.k.a. has a mind change. So when I was growing up, what this verse meant was when someone gave their heart to Christ, they said the sinner's prayer, that is someone repenting and heaven's rejoicing because now that person is not going to hell when they die, they're going to heaven. Do these definitions sound familiar in these understandings? But Jesus is saying one person who's missing the mark, which we know now we were alienated in our minds which we quote this verse almost every week, Colossians 1.21. We're alienated in our minds. One person missing the mark in their head who has a mind change and realizes, I've always belonged. Who do you identify as? Do you identify as the one that left the 99 and was out here in the wilderness and Jesus came after you? I definitely identify as that in certain periods of my life. I want you to know you, you were only lost because you were originally in the hundred. If you go to the next one, the lost piece of silver, either that woman having 10 pieces of silver, we're hammering home this concept. If she lose one piece, doesn't light a candle and sweep the house, this is verse 8 of Luke 15, and seek diligently till she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together saying, rejoice with me, for I have found the piece which I had lost. So she's got 10 this lost piece belonged originally. And then it gets misplaced, however that happened. And then she lights a candle, which today would be your cell phone flashlight, and looks for that thing, looks for that thing till she finds it. You know, and I see a, a, a trajectory here with these three parables as well. A sheep is dumb. A sheep needs a shepherd. It needs to be shown where to go. All right? So, a lost coin is an inanimate object. Right? So, we can see the value of a sheep. To me, it's kind of... We can have different stages in our life. So, you get, you get to the story of the prodigal son, and this is an adult male. The father has raised him to a certain age, and the son decides to leave, and he becomes lost. But did he originally belong? Yes. Did his lostness change his value? No. We're going old school four and a half years ago with the cell phone example. Uh, his lostness, if anything, increases his value to the father. And the coin's lostness, if anything, increased its value to the woman. And the sheep, when it wandered off, its value, if anything, increased. So if anything, our message is to tell people of how valuable they are. That they originally belonged. And if you need to receive that for yourself, receive it. If you can understand the union you have with the Father it will begin to make you whole. 
which the word translated salvation, we know by now, means to be made whole. You begin to be saved. Now, if you can take that out of the afterlife context for a second, walking in salvation is stepping into wholeness. Now. Now, if heaven is like they tell us, you don't need wholeness there. You already got it. Right? You're not sick there. You know all things there. You don't have any issues there. But now, we do. And maybe we are. So we need salvation or wholeness now. So many of these terms have been incorrectly defined just over time. And they've begun to mean something. And we haven't gone back to figure out what it actually means. So don't apologize for your uniqueness. You belong in the family of God. You always have. You may feel lost, but it's only in your head. It's only between your ears. It's only because you were taught things incorrectly. It's only in your mind, not reality. And that feeling of lostness is proof you belong. For something to be lost, it had to have first belonged. This gospel is a family declaration that we are one blood, we are one family, and you may not believe like me, and I may not believe like you, and I may, may be here on the journey, and you're back here, and I've rejected this doctrine or this doctrine, and now believe in this doctrine, but guess what? Our love is meant to be the glue that, that binds us, transcending any sort of differences, because we're a family. So the prodigal son is different than the sheep who's dumb and needs a leader and is not an inanimate object. He is a, I don't know how old he is, but he's raised to an age old enough he can leave the house. So when he leaves, the father doesn't panic. I believe this father is trusting. I've poured enough into my boy that he'll be back. You know, I've heard the illustration of a city dog versus a country dog. Dogs, by nature, want to go explore. So if you have a dog that's always lived in the city, this is what they do at the fence. <laughs> and they want to jump the fence and run out into the street and explore the neighborhood because they've never been allowed to explore. But a country dog, you drive into the country and you see dogs just chilling on their master's porch everywhere. I believe because they were allowed to explore. They've run around all the land and concluded, you know the best spot for me? is on my master's porch. So don't freak out if your children are exploring. Because they may end up like the prodigal son and realize there's no better place for me than in my father's house where I originally belong. I went exploring because I never understood I belonged. So I'm going to go try to belong somewhere. And it was much more relaxed at the bar than it was at church. And I could be much more open with my friends who weren't Christians. And this was just my experience. It's not everybody's experience. So I began to not trust the church with my, actually, what's really going on. And would put forth this thing and it wasn't real. And guess what? It got exhausting. It's like the beginning of the message. I was modifying my behavior to try and obtain belonging, and that begins to wear you out. So I'm like, I want to go somewhere where I don't have to modify my behavior. That's supposed to be the church, which is us. It's not just a building. But when we're all in this place, when people come in, they feel that immediately, right? Right? So he wakes up in the pig pen, which we know he's a Jewish boy, so this is especially demeaning because pork is unclean, and he's in the pig pen, and he comes to himself, and he goes home, and then he begins to list his sins to the father. And the father won't even hear it because God is love, and love keeps no record of wrongs. He's reminding, who in the story is... a a picture of God, the Father, of his sin, which is something the Father doesn't remember. 
because he is love and has no record of wrongs. Sins and lawless deeds, he remembers no more. Sin is a transgression of the law, according to John. You've never been under the law. So you never sinned according to the law. The only sin we're in is missing the mark. And I believe, among other things, that mark is who we actually are and who God actually is. So in the new covenant, the only command we have is Jesus said, love others as I have loved you. So we're walking in sin if we don't have a revelation of the love of God. <laughs> That's sin. Do you understand what I'm saying? Be then we can't love others because we don't even know he loves us because we think he just wants to modify our behavior so that we can obtain acceptance for him. And like I said last week, I like to picture myself the whole time that I was wandering in the pig pen that I had a purple robe of righteousness on and I had my sandals on my feet and I had a ring on my finger. I just didn't know. So I was living like I didn't know. Because we walk out what we believe we are. We walk out if we believe we're accepted or not. Your behavior, who you date, who you go after, will all spring from if you believe you belong or not. If you believe you have acceptance and who you believe God to be and you. And when if we keep preaching this behavior modification message that for God to accept people, uh, they need to modify this, that, and that and jump through these 13 hoops... We're not going to get anywhere. We're locking people in to the behavioral realm when the gospel is really about family and a love that transcends differences. Amen? I'll open it up for anybody to close. I don't know if someone is already planning to close. But if that's stirring anything in you, if you want to share a quick word about you, you modifying your behavior to be accepted, it's open for that. Um, but if not, of course, you don't have to. But I hope this touches your heart. You're a son and a daughter. You're secure. You don't have to change anything about you. You don't have to apologize for who you are. Don't apologize for your, your uniqueness. Let's be a people who, when others are around us, they feel like they can let their guard down. And we're a safe place. And that all springs from us knowing the Father is a safe place. That he's not going to whack us or make us regret being transparent. That's not who he is. Amen? Wow, two weeks in a row. I never speak. <laughs> <laughs>